the Toowoomba branch, of Darling Downs branch of ETAC, and so it's my privilege to introduce Kathleen Bennett to you, who's from up the hill as well. And, um, I was going to rely on Kathleen's bio, but it's characteristically very brief and modest. So <clears throat> suffice to say, though, that Kathleen is um, a wonderful practitioner and a very generous um, teacher. She's at the forefront of um, developments from functional grammar through to obviously what we're doing here with the new syllabuses. Um, and she's uh, always very, very um, kind and offering to participate and to uh, lead sessions. So um, please join me in welcoming Kathleen. Thanks, Rowan, and I also want to acknowledge the collegial support um, that we have up on the Darling Downs in terms of um, the work that is being done in the um, syllabus and future initiatives. So today, um, I first want to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land, past, present and future, of the <coughs> land in which we meet. And um, I'm going to ask you to complete an orientating activity to begin with. I want you to read the following section of text and write down then your predictions um, concerning what will happen next. And maybe also note um, the words or the clues in the text that would have helped you make that prediction. So I'll just read it. It was a warm day and they had behaved as they promised they could, so there must be ice cream. Veronica took her sister's hand. That afternoon, so near to winter, the sky was very blue. The sun felt soft as a cat. The children on the footpath paused to wave to their mother. For them, at their age, a trip to the milk bar could take on the dimensions of a voyage. The mother straightened from the soil, hair falling into her eyes. Her children's voices were thin and high, the piping of chicks in a nest. Goodbye, my love, she said, the words no more than her habit. The mother would remember later the white glint of silver coins held tight in the palm of her son. So if you just write down a prediction and maybe the clues that you are working on in the text. <coughs> So now I'll move to the next section of text. Christopher was five, with a child's ponderous gait. His older sisters, leggy as fillies, must match their pace to his. Zoe's thoughts would drift as she ambled, lingering on insects and flowers. Bending again to her garden, the mother knew without calculation that her children would be gone for half an hour. 15 minutes to the shop, 15 minutes home. So now, um, if you can write down your next prediction, and whether your prediction has changed in any way and the um, clues that you're working on in the text. And then the next section of text. The route they'd take to the milk bar would bend around four corners of the suburban neighbourhood. Two right turns, two left. Their neighbourhood was a modest one and the distances between the corners were not great. The result of all the twisting was that no one who saw the Metford children walking through that clear afternoon would see them for very long. 
So now, uh, your prediction. So now what I'll ask my uh, confreres from Toowoomba is to hand out the little booklet that's got this text in it uh, so that you could read towards the end of it. So I've got Rowan and Chris. Thank you. So this is an activity um, that I would do with students and normally I would give them um, sections of the text cut up, also have it on the screen as well. For some students they like to see um, the words on the page, but also when they build up the sections of text it shows them that there's a developing idea and at that certain points in the narrative our perceptions of what happens changes and then they match their thinking to the thinking of the author. So if you look on, um, it's page three of this handout. The next section of text, which I'll just read. The first witness was changing attire on his knees uncomfortably on a stone driveway. He noticed the children because the little boy passing the gate made an infant's um, noise for a car. Brum. The sound made the man smile, the only thing to have done all day. The witness recognised the Metfords as local, although he did not know their names. He would tell the police that when he saw them, the children were alone. So at this point in the narrative, the um, text takes on a different meaning with the use of the words police and witness. So that's what students respond to. Ultimately, um, there are other witnesses who are referred to, and then a man comes into the picture. To the final point, where the children are at the milk bar, there's a teacher who taught one of the children who is at the milk bar. She sees them there and um, she doesn't really notice the man. And um, if you look then at your handout on page three, that's the end of the section of the text. It talks about in 1977, the year of the snake, and it goes through all of these things that happened. Elvis died and it's the year of... Um, the United Nations banned the sale of arms to Africa. A whole list of things and then there's that last line. Three children bought no ice cream, did not return home. So that's from um, Sonia Hartnett. It's the prologue of her text called Of a Boy. When you um, give that to students, I find that they actually want to go and read the text. And then I tell them it's not about the disappearance of the um, children at all. It's, it's something that's in the background and permeates that time and place, but that's not what the text is about. So I'm going to revisit that text um, very shortly um, as an example of how we as teachers provide students with examples of how they can intervene in a text. Um, so there's the um, screen there, the first witness, and they are the words that you would um, highlight with the children and the use of the word police. So it's from Sonia Hartnett. There's the, um, again, the specifications of what we're looking at and probably focusing on those ways that we traditionally respond with a short story, a memoir, interior monologue, chapter, drama script. But two things that I want to concentrate on today um, that are mentioned in the syllabus are the creation of perspectives and representations and experimentation and manipulating. I see them as key things, um, uh, particularly with this syllabus, half of the um, assessment is creative. And I think looking at, um, I was just reading a submission um, the other day for panel on Monday and I came across another text and it must have been an imaginative response to the theme of Australia. I don't know how many I've read over time about um, the drought breaking and then a drop of rain coming at the end. And then when I started to think about a lot of what we read in, there is, um, I would say, very little experimentation with the narrative voice. And I think um, what Lisa said in terms of 
the students writing for their readers, they are writing for themselves and not for readers. And that's a very different perception to have. So what I would traditionally see is there's, um, at the beginning, there's a point in time and then students traditionally go to recount and they might recount and have an anecdote or two within that and then they come back to the present and something they've learned or that's changed. So let's have a look at today trying to move students away from giving those sorts of responses and allowing them opportunities to experiment or as I say, um, it's perspective and play and then playing with perspective and they will probably find that very confronting to do. <coughs> so just briefly, um, when we look at this form of writing, um, I go back to the work of Lindsay Williams, when he, um, which he has presented many times, and it was really a, a presentation that he did in the Darling Downs many years ago that started me thinking about the way that um, children are responding. And I just so happened to be reading at the time the um, Sonia Hartnett text and went into the class on Monday and used that. So we're talking about the slice of life, we're talking about one, two or three characters, a brief orientation, a focus on language features and it's not just figurative language, we're talking about synonyms, antonyms, we're talking about collocation and then some techniques for moving the story along without going into the traditional here I am, here's a recount, using the circumstances of time and place. Um, and when you look at um, or you read Misson's and Morgan's book about the critical and the aesthetic, I think the really good analogy they have or how they talk about the aesthetic is it's not the beauty, it's the intensity. And if you look at what we're requiring students to do or to achieve um, very highly in this task, they're in this um, 1,500 to 2,000 words, there is an intensity in that little bit of text that we're expecting to see from students. So today I wanted to focus on just some example texts that I've used and some of the responses from students that have been provoked um, by that. The other thing I wanted to say about the narrator's voice is generally the students who do, <coughs> do well have a strong authorial voice. And I think I've also got this in the first couple of pages. So all of this outlined here is in the first couple of pages of your handout. So it's not just a matter of the techniques, but for us to examine or to talk about the pleasure that we gain in reading different texts. And um, I, uh, when Lisa was talking, I was thinking about, you know, we are immersing students in text and a variety of texts. But what I find quite challenging when students are in senior, their reading drops off. So unless you're prescribing some reading for them, they will tell you they don't have time to read. And often when you're talking to students at the end of year 12, they're saying, I'd really you know, like to now be able to go and read. So sometimes I think our role is because we are by nature vast readers or read a lot, we bring that into the classroom. There's no reason why we should hesitate to share in that and share different examples and ideas for them. And the important thing is the last line there is to <coughs> encourage them to engage playfully with the texts that they're doing. Uh, Marcus Zusak released his book, The Bridge of Clay, last week, and I just thought this quotation was interesting, <coughs> that it, he, it took him 12 years to write it. He said, I wrote the first chapter over and over again for years. The first six years, the narrator was a girl called Maggie, but there were problems there, then I took her out. I tried everyone, other characters in the text, Penny, Michael, I think I might have even considered the donkey as a narrator, <laughs> but it wasn't working. I missed deadline nine or 10, then I went for a surf. So his wife at that point said, you've got to go, go for a surf, but he came back and he found that he had a strong um, narrative voice. And I wonder sometimes whether we actually um, do enough to make students aware that they're not just writing a narrative for themselves, that they have to consider from what stance they are doing it. And it's all of those things that Lisa had up on the screen to um, subvert, to engage, to um, entertain, or um, to all of those sorts of things that we want them to do. So with the aesthetic and the critical, and I took them, this again from um, Misson and Morgan's book, I think these things are really important. We are the framers of what happens in the classroom. And 
it is a fine line because you don't want to be so prescriptive in how they should respond that you tie down, in their words, every particular activity, every particular of the task or activity so tightly that it's almost like a um, prescribed response. You want to leave it open enough that you get, um, and that you see students' creativity develop. And the third thing is that this type of teaching is unashamedly intervenes in their reading and writing. We intervene even when we make um, selections about the texts that are being read. And we intervene in the way that we frame these lessons on the aesthetic or, you know, the creative element. And we have to have that room for play and experimentation. So I'm just going to go back to Sonia Hartnett's of a boy. Really, this is um, a playing with genre because I'm going to show you a, um, a student text and I just want you to have a look. So this student actually was responding to the poem on page um, six, seven and eight, and then going into page nine. So under the current syllabus, the student was responding to the poem Australia by Anna Woolwich. And that to me is part of the theme of alienation and isolation. So I looked at some of the poems and the poets on the prescribed um, text list that you could use. So I have an, exa um, an example there from Lionel Fogarty, Alan Van Neeuwen, um, W. H. Auden, and Kate Templeton. Oh, sorry, yeah, Kate Templeton's text. Then I've also got um, short stories there. I think the Annie Prue close range. Um, series of short stories were focused or have a, um, a strong focus on isolation and then poems from T.S. Eliot as well. Interesting thing with Kate Templeton's Brand New Ancients, um, for those of you who may not have encountered it as yet, it is like you are reading um, a novella in verse form. So it starts off with um, two different couples and then parallel stories basically and how they intersect and then having children. And that one there, I think, could be really useful for looking at different points in the text where students can intervene um, to make changes. But uh, for the Australia one, I just want you to read there how the student had um, adapted it in their own response. <coughs> I was just thinking to myself, this would be great for the website. People would be able to fast forward through the um, gaps and the, the silences on the screen. But uh, basically, you have it from the point of view um, taking the voice. And I think that um, one thing I've noticed is that um, poems that are monologues have a strong authorial voice, which um, is very 
um, advantageous for students when they're adapting it. So here you have the example of a young boy, grand final day in Melbourne. The student had been to Melbourne with his family, so had that in his mind. And it works well because um, the boy's going on the um, train into Flinders Street Station. Everybody's moving around and he's doing all the touristy things on the day. And he's waiting for that final moment when everyone spills out and they come back into um, Flinders Street to disperse. And they're all up watching the um, grand final on the, the post-match celebrations on the big screen. And you'll notice like there was that one line with Sonia Hartnett's, the student finishes off with the last CCTV footage of Yusuf showed his arms outstretched above his head as his fingers curled in to press the triggers held by his thumbs. And so it starts off with um, uh, reference to um, different people who might have seen the boy and then um, as the narrative progresses it goes to CCTV footage, which I think also um, perhaps strengthens that idea of the boy feeling isolated from the rest of the community. So that's how um, a student then used the ideas from a narrative that had different perspectives. So you're still that um, omniscient um, narrator, but you're just showing little slices of different perspectives. It's still a moment in time, but it allows that multi-layered approach. So I think that one works well in the classroom with um, a variety of different texts students might be using. The next one is um, Ordinary Day with Peanuts. When I first read this book, uh, this um, short story years ago, it was in a collection uh, of fantasy and science fiction. And it's by Shirley Jackson. Um, you may know her for The Lottery, which is often a, a short story used in dystopian fiction. So you start reading this and it's about Mr. John Philip Johnston. And I've just taken an excerpt there for you. You can also find um, very, uh, there's quite a um, lot of examples of this on the internet. You can get the whole story. So uh, Mr. John Phillips uh, Johnston, he goes about his day helping people. And really the short story is about a series of encounters he has with different people helping them. And as reflects modern society, they're very suspicious of him. So um, it gets to the end of the story. If you look at page 12, we're going to go um, from the last column. And this is where um, it's an interesting turn. He was on his own corner and went straight up to his apartment. He let himself in and called, hello, and Mrs. Johnson answered from the kitchen. Hello, dear, aren't you early? Took a taxi home, Mr. Johnson said. I remember the cheesecake too. What's for dinner? Mrs. Johnson came out of the kitchen and kissed him. She was a comfortable woman and smiling as Mr. Johnson smiled. Hard day, she asked. Not very, said Mr. Johnson, hanging his coat in the closet. How about you? So, so, she said. She stood in the kitchen doorway while he settled into an easy chair and took off his good shoes and took out the paper he had bought that morning. Here and there, she said. I didn't do so badly, Mr. Johnson said, a couple of young people. Fine, she said. I had a little nap this afternoon, took it easy most of the day went into a department store this morning and accused the woman next to me of shoplifting and had the store detective pick her up. Sent three dogs to the pound, you know, the usual thing. Oh, and listen, she added, remembering. What? asked Mr Johnson. Well, she said, I got onto a bus and asked the driver for a transfer. And when he helped someone else, um, at first I said that he was impertinent and quarrelled with him. And then I said, why wasn't he in the army? And I said it loud enough for everyone to hear and took his number and I turned in a complaint probably got him fired. Fine, said Mr Johnson, but you do look tired. Want to change over tomorrow? Oh, I'd like to, she said. I could do with the change. Right, said Mr Johnson. What's for dinner? Veal cutlet. Had it for lunch, said Mr Johnson. So you're reading this story and it just seems, what's this about? It's so-so, this man helping everyone and then suddenly it takes on a very different turn at the end. And when you go back and then have a look at the, uh, re-read the story, you look at his interconnections with people and he's not really connecting with them. So um, the interesting thing was that the students, when I, I find they really respond to the ending and it brings you into that area of magic realism as well, where something looks very, very ordinary and then it turns out not to be. So I've just got um, another example here of My Last Duchess, and I know this is on the prescribed list for English, but you could also use it in literature if you're talking about power and control.
So I'll just let you um, have a read of that one as well on page 14. So with this text again, I think the, uh, what works with it is the narrator and the unexpected, the narrator being the entombed duchess on the wall. And it starts off, you know that there's someone else in the room and you don't um, necessarily know um, who it is. You think it is a person and as the narrative builds and the new duchess is heading towards the back of the room, it is revealed that she is heading to the curtain where there is the portrait. One thing that helps this is the um, strong authorial voice in the original text. You get a great sense of who the Duke is, what um, students then need to do is flesh out what he's, um, his actions, his movements. And that is a, a great activity to do with something like a monologue. So the Duke is talking. Um, what would, how would he be um, acting? What would he be saying? What would he be doing at the time? So you're fleshing out, um, and I think this is often a problem with dialogue. Students are very good at putting their dialogue down first. And sometimes you get those drafts that are all dialogue and there's nothing um, else in between. And dialogue can move along action, but there's got to be a balance as well. So um, this one here, the student was inspired by the one ordinary day with um, peanuts. He thought it was just interesting at the end that there was a completely, completely through you. And also by the last line in the um, of a boy text, because if you look at the um, last line here, it's almost like an understatement as well. Well, maybe I will not be the last duchess to join the gallery. And the student was also inspired by Another student response used it as an exemplar, which I'll show you over the page. And this one was in response to Marcus Zusak, um, The Book Thief. And again, this is experimentation with narration. So often students try to, really when they look at something like a poem or the original text, they're just trying to put it in a prose form. And um, just keep it the same without not much change. So by playing with the narrator, they are actually not just changing um, the form, they're changing the perspective. So this one is personifying an abstraction, which I think can work well in text. So it's taking death and making it into the particular, and that is one key element of the aesthetic. We are reading slices of time where we've gone from the abstract into the particular. And when you look at Marcus Zusak's text, he is great for um, experimentation with sentence length. So I've just taken an excerpt there from The Book Thief, where um, death um, comes into, um, there's a plane crash. He reconnects with The Book Thief there. Um, she's one of the crowd who come along. And then he talks about taking the body away. 
So there's another student excerpt and that's in response to Robert Frost's um, home burial. And I'll just give you a moment to um, read excerpts from that one as well, page 17 and page 18. So with this one, it actually, you can see strong parallels with the original text, particularly the ending where it talks about the colours. Death in um, the book Thief always talks about the colours. But um, when you, you read writers and writing, they say that nothing is truly original in that you're always, um, you're always influenced by something you've read before and you just don't know how it's going to come out. So it allows the student, though, to play with the idea of metaphor and simile, um, which is important in the aesthetic. And the student wanted to leave it open at the end as to who, you don't know who has died at the end or who's the fallen one. Um, it's left it open as to whether it's the husband or the wife. And that last line there, um, I despair of humans, it's really like the last line in the original text, I'm haunted by humans. So again, it's a direct sort of borrowing and parallel, but it has extended it in some way beyond something that is suburban and it allows a narrator to have sympathy for both characters, I think. The next text um, there that you have is um, what I would call a delicious little text. It's Gertrude Talks Back and it's from Margaret Atwood. And it was in, originally in a book of hers called Good Bones and Simple Murders. But if you've also got a um, text at school called Hamlet and Related Readings, you'll find this in there. So in your booklet on page 19, there's the original section of the text. So we're going to the scene where Hamlet confronts his mother. And again, you could um, just show this or have students read this section of text, show a film representation. They don't need to have read the whole text. But what is happening here is it's changing it's going to that what if moment. What if Gertrude didn't accept what Hamlet said? What if she fought back? And um, it's just a, a delicious little reading, so I'll let you um, have a read. This text also is available on the um, internet as well. Mm -hmm. 
So what I like about this um, text, it, it does have a strong authorial voice. It is like a monologue. I can't help but read it without thinking of um, Patsy of Ab Fab or <laughs> True and Prue. Like when she goes, no darling, I'm not mad at you. Um, but I must say you're an awful prig sometimes. So to me, she takes on this life and vision in my mind, um, Gertrude. But it really sort of throws things on um, their head. And um, a student response, responding to um, writing a narrative for Hamlet. I'll just have you, let you have a look at the student response on page 21. He's not doing a first person response. Again, he's doing a third person, um, but the narrator is very um, sympathetic to Claudius. And what I like about it is Claudius, he's wandering back to his chambers after another drunken night and then he slides down and then someone is yelling at him and he goes, oh God, it's you again, my brother. And it's a completely different um, reaction than you get in the play where everyone is scared about the ghost. So it's asking those questions. Do you think the ghost just appeared to Hamlet? Who else would he have made an appearance to? So some students say, well, he could have appeared to um, Gertrude, he could have appeared to Claudius. And then Claudius, he's not scared. Um, because he's prayed and he said, I'm not prepared to give up those things that I've gained, my um, crown, my own ambition and my queen. So he's just saying, oh, for God's uh, sake, brother, calls him a pompous windbag. And then um, the, the narrative, it has that lovely tone to it. And that's where a text like um, Margaret Atwood's one has this lovely tone is that, that is sustained. And that's all you want for that little um, slice of life. I'll just let you finish reading that one for a minute. <coughs> I think that student response too also shows you the strength of irony. And that is often the difference between an A response and a B or C response. And the irony comes through from um, that sustained tone as well. One thing or two about the text you'll notice with um, the Shakespearean text and also the one referring to My Last Duchess, the students have to, one of the challenges too is to immerse yourself in the language of um, the time and place. So the fabric of the curtains or the furnishings, um, what people are wearing. You'll notice that in the Shakespearean one, you know, he fell down onto the flagstones or the cobblestones. There is an element of research and in the last, my last Duchess excerpt, the student actually went and looked at who were the artists of the time. So while the Duke is taking um, the new Duchess around and he's talking about these masters, she's drawn off to the curtain and the rear wall. So that is something that I think is really um, very, students enjoy and it's part of that experimentation with language as well. You'll just see there on um, page 22, students I find are very reticent once they draft to change something. Yes. And um, I see that is uh, obviously across the board. <laughs> One thing for them to do is you direct how they do something. So there's an example on page um, 22 of an activity to do in class. So we did it first of all with um, different text excerpts from student work and asked the students to, to change things around. So you're deliberately going to begin with dialogue or begin a sentence with a dependent clause or you're going to circle a couple of your verbs and you're going to change them. Have a look at your noun group, circle two of them, add to it. So you are deliberately asking students to do that and once they do that with a text, um, someone else's text, then they can come and do that with their own. Because the important um, part is there, if you look at the screen, is students think the drafting is proofreading and editing, and that's your job. Um, but the whole thing about revision and actually 
changing the voice, changing the, narr the narrator, go back to Marcus Zusak. I wasn't happy with that narrator. Will I change it? Perspective again, changing the perspective to create a strong perspective in their final piece. There's just a couple more examples I wanted to show you. This is Everything is Alive. It's a little um, website and if you look at page um, 23, just the top there, it's um, an unscripted interview show in which all the subjects are inanimate objects. In each episode, a different thing tells its life story and everything it says is true. And there are podcasts with writers and comedians, so they're about half an hour long. If you have trouble um, going to the website, you can find them on YouTube. On your handout there, I've got Lewis Can of Cola. He's episode one. He's been on the shelf a long time, but he's had some time to think. Then you've got Maeve, the lamppost. She sees all of us, but does anyone see her? And Dennis, the pillow. While we are sleeping, Dennis has dreams too. Of course he does, as pillows are wont to do. Then there's Paul Tooth. He may have been knocked out, but he's not giving up. <laughs> Anna, the elevator. She is headed for great heights. And Tara, bar of soap. Tara may be a sliver now, but she's got a lot of fight. So, um, I have a year 10 taste of literature class at the moment, and we've been looking at representations of fear. So for this um, unit, we're looking at fear and complacency, and we're looking at um, strictly boring. So I've just put down there a couple of suggestions. We're going to, so what students have to do is choose an object or a symbol, and then use that to provide insights into characters and events. So some of the things they've chosen, of course, um, an obvious one is the jacket I think that Scott wears at the end, which belonged to um, Fran's father, because it can tell a story far beyond the text. Some students then have chosen Fran's practice skirt um, because that was worn by her mother. But um, one interesting one I thought was one of the students was going for the number 100 that was on the back of Scott's jacket and was worn by his parents. Someone else thought of the calendar that is crossed off um, throughout the film because we're getting, we're getting we're, it's three weeks till the Pan Pacific Championships. So the students come up with um, different ideas and I've uh, found it just forces them and it makes them a little uncomfortable because um, they're not used to such sort of experimentation. And um, what I liked about this sort of idea is you have to become that object. And as writers say, you have to immerse yourself in the story. You have to be part of the story that you're creating. So this then means they have to take on the role of that object. They have to think, what do I sound like? What do I look like? So Paul the can, he talks about being in the fridge and it was a bit cold and I was a bit slushy, you know, and then someone sort of took me home, put me in the cupboard and I was there for um, a number of months. So those sorts of things students have to think of. But I suppose the point is too, this um, final piece that is becoming part of their confirmation, it's the result of years of exposure. And so we must do the experimentation in the junior years and making students um, uncomfortable with perhaps roles that you're giving them. So we'll see how this one um, goes. And the other one that I came across recently, to me it's sort of like a parallel text, is Patrick Ness's And the Ocean Was Our Sky, where it's written from um, the point of view of one of the whales in Moby Dick. And it is really, um, what I like about it is, uh, I've given you a section of text there on page 23, you do have to become the whale and the students then have to, or if, um, in Patrick Ness's case, look at the language of the sea. So he talks about things such as briny breath and this is where I think close exercises work well. Don't forget close exercises and author's work. Take out words, give students a section of text and say, well, what word would you put in there? And then they look at the author's choice. But I thought this one would be a good one to do with that type of activity. Um, the whales call the part in the man's world where you breach and go up into the air, that's the abyss. Um, the water filled with the clicks of our echolocations. And I furiously sent out my clicks waiting for the response to echo off the great ball of way, um, waxy, so it should be, sorry, waxy liquid in my forehead. So 
students have to think about what would it actually like, be like to be a whale when you give them a task like this. So I think that one is a um, really lovely little text and it's not um, very long either. So um, that's it from me. You'll see on the last section there, um, just uh, the list of texts that I have, other references as well. So there is a text that I think is used for the VCE from um, Robert Beardwood. He has examples in his um, chapter on creative responses. He has a, um, creative examples of student work. And then um, the other one, Brian Noon's text, he has a good section with some activities on um, creative responses. So um, thanks very much for your time today.